It's been a long day. You've all been very patient, and I hope it's been a worthwhile uh, experience and a day for you. And we're very, very pleased to have this opportunity to have Ambassador Tsui with us. Um, this was not originally in the program, but uh, given all of the developments that have occurred in the last several days, it became opportune to ask Ambassador Tsui to join us this afternoon to share some insights and some thoughts uh, from the People's Republic of China. Uh, let me say, Am ambassadors are like uh, pilots that fly big airplanes. You know, most of the time you don't really care because the plane is flying itself, but it's when you have really severe turbulence that you're glad you have an experienced pilot. And I can just tell you from my experience, having worked with Ambassador Tsui for a number of years, there's no finer ambassador in Washington, especially to handle turbulence. And we're in the middle of that right now. And so would you all, with your applause, please thank Ambassador Tsui for coming and joining us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. Thank you for your very kind words. I'm not sure whether I have the license to, to be a pilot. <laughs> but I'm certainly here to enjoy this opportunity of exchanging my views with all of you. I think, well, it's always so good for me to come back to CSIS. I think I spend more time here, perhaps, than in any other think tank in Washington, D.C. Uh, now, we are here today to discuss, about, to discuss the situation of the South China Sea. And for that matter, let me, first of all, refer all of you to two important statements issued by the Chinese side earlier today. One is the statement by the government of China on China's territorial sovereignty and maritime rights and interests in the South China Sea. The other is a statement issued by China's foreign ministry on the award of the arbitral tribunal. I think that these two statements outline China's position with great clarity and authority. I would strongly recommend all of you to have a careful reading of these two documents. And on that basis, within the framework of these two important statements, let me try to offer a few comments, and maybe we could discuss these points of view. First, why China rejects the tribunal, this arbitration? We believe that the submission, the initiation of this arbitration case violates the general practice that arbitration should be premised on state consent. And China made an optional exception declaration back in 2006 in accordance with Article 298 of the Convention on the Law of the Sea, which excludes issues like maritime delimitation from such processes. So this case is done without the consent of China. Also, it exceeds its own jurisdiction. The case was carefully masked, but it's beyond any doubt that the core issues are territorial disputes. And territorial issues are not subject to the UNCLOS. People may say the tribunal may decide its own jurisdiction, but they don't have a free hand. They have to take the decision in strict accordance with the provisions of the Convention. Failure to recognize that is a matter of professional incompetence. Deliberate disregard 
is a matter of questionable integrity. Also, this case was initiated not out of goodwill or good faith. We all know the United Nations Charter calls for development of friendly relations among its members. And the Convention on the Law of the Sea itself starts with the call for a spirit of mutual understanding and cooperation. But this case, this arbitration case was initiated not in such good faith or good will. It is a clear attempt to use legal instruments for political purposes. What is more disturbing is that the proceedings will probably do a great deal of damage to the efforts by the members of the international community to engage in negotiations and consultation for settlement of any possible disputes. What is astonishing is that this tribunal even belittles the DOC, the Declaration of Conduct of Parties to the South China Sea. And that DOC is an instrument that is the result of a decade long of joint diplomatic efforts by China and the ASEAN countries. And it embodies the solemn commitments of all the parties concerned. So this arbitration case will probably open the door of abusing arbitration procedures. It will certainly undermine or weaken the motivation of states to engage in negotiations and consultations for solving their disputes. It will certainly intensify conflicts and even confrontation. In the end, it will undermine the authority and effectiveness of international law. And such absurd proceedings were taking place in combination with military coercion, with mounting activities by destroyers, aircraft carriers, strategic bombers, reconnaissance planes, and many others. So I believe this is an outright manifestation of might is right. So under these circumstances, China has no alternative but to oppose to it and reject it. We are doing this to safeguard our own interests as we have the right to do so. But more importantly, we are doing this to defend international justice and the true spirit of international law as we have the responsibility to do so. What is happening to China today could probably happen tomorrow to any other member of the international community. And China has to stand up to it and stop it. China has a firm will to safeguard its own interests and rights and international justice. We will not yield to any pressure, be it in the form of military activities, media criticism, or some self-claimed legal bodies. And we will certainly not make deals with our core interests just for a few words of praise. Indeed, in any country, if a government fails to stand up and defend its own sovereignty and territory, if it fails to defend the core interests of its own people, there's no image to speak of. 
So people might ask, what has intensified tensions in the region? Well, China has long-standing sovereignty over the islands and reefs in South China Sea. And this sovereignty had never been challenged until the late 1970s, when more and more Chinese islands and reefs were illegally occupied by others. But even so, the situation was under control. China and other regional countries were able to manage the, uh, the, the differences for so many years. And we were able to develop an overall friendly and cooperative relationship with each other. We even succeeded in formulating the DOC. And there had been small but significant progress towards joint de uh, development of resources. But tensions started to rise about five or six years ago. About the same time when we began to hear about the so-called pivoting to Asia. So in the last few years, disputes intensified, relations strained, confidence weakened. And these issues have taken up so much time and energy at so many regional and international fora. Such time and energy should have spent on the promotion of cooperation. Have anyone really benefited from this? I don't think so. Not China, not ASEAN countries, not even the United States in the long run. If Asia Pacific is destabilized, if the momentum of regional economic growth is weakened, if armed conflict started, everybody, everybody's interest will be hurt, including our interest, the interests of other regional countries, and I'm sure the interests of the United States. As for those people who might have the illusion that they could have a free ride on this pivoting exercise and still gain something from it, please go to countries like Iraq, Libya, and Syria and ask the people there. So be careful what you wish. You might actually get it. Some might put the blame on China on China's recent reclamation activities. But the fact is, China is the last country to do so. And we are doing so only on the islands and reefs under our own control. Islands and reefs that will have people stationed there. We are not trying to take, him back, to take back the islands and reefs that have been illegally occupied by others. And of course, speed does not change the nature of the issue. And with the completion of the facilities that we are building there, I'm sure we'll be able to offer more international goods, services for civilian uses. Of course, the bottom line is that we will be in a position to defend ourselves. And many things have been done under the name of freedom of navigation. But freedom of navigation for commercial vessels have never encountered problems in South China Sea. And the so-called freedom of navigation operations by the United States were originally designed as a countermeasure to the provisions of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And many contracting parties believe that a, dis a distinction should be made between the freedom of navigation for commercial vessels, for civilian vessels, and that for 
military vessels. China firmly stands for freedom of navigation in South China Sea because these sea lanes are the economic lifelines for China and for many regional countries. We will do everything possible to safeguard the unimpeded flow of commerce and stop any attempt to destabilize the region. But what worries us is that that might be some self-fulfilling prophecies. Such an assembly of aircraft carriers, airplanes, sophisticated weapons could pose a real threat to the freedom of navigation of commercial and civilian vessels. Such a concentration of firepower anywhere in the world would be a source of concern. So, how should we deal with the disputes now? I believe negotiations and consultation among the parties concerned still offer the most feasible and effective way. Diplomatic efforts should not be blocked and will not be blocked by a scrap of paper or by a fleet of aircraft carriers. China remain committed to negotiations and consultations with other parties. This position has never changed and will not change. In fact, China has a, an excellent record in this regard. We have already resolved the boundary issues with 12 neighbors out of 14 on the land. And we even have agreement with Vietnam for part of the maritime delimitation in what we call Bay Buan and others might call Tonkin Bay. So we are confident that China and the other parties concerned, if we are not disturbed, will be able to resolve the disputes over time through negotiations and consultations. And this record of China's, of solving boundary issues with its neighbors, I think is quite unique in the world. I don't think you could give me another example of solving such long and long-standing border issues with its neighbors in the last few decades. So the door is always open for negotiations and consultations. And we have full confidence in our relation with our neighbors, particularly the ASEAN countries. Maritime disputes or territorial disputes is only part of the relations between China and some of the ASEAN countries. It certainly does not represent the entirety of our relations. It is certainly not the entirety of China's relation with the ASEAN countries as a group. And we have been neighbors for centuries. We are actually a community of common destiny. All of us have high stakes in regional stability, peace, and prosperity. And all of us will benefit a great deal from closer cooperation and enhanced mutual confidence. And none of us would ever pivot to anywhere else in the world. So what should we do between us, between China and the United States? First of all, these territorial issues in South China Sea should not become issues between our two countries. We don't have territorial disputes between us. Still less 
shall they be seen as part of so-called strategic rivalry between our two countries. These are just territorial disputes. They should not be magnified or exaggerated. And we should never allow them to define this important relationship between our two great countries. I'm sure my friend Dan Crittenbrink must have made this point this morning here. I totally agree with him on this point. Number two, Cold War mentality will not solve the problems of today's world. Today, the world needs more than ever before partnership among the countries, especially the major players. Today, the world needs more than ever before a set of new international relations centered on win-win cooperation. So we in China, we stand for a new model of relationship with the United States characterized by no conflict, no confrontation, mutual respect, and women cooperation. We want to see a constructive and a positive interaction in the Asia Pacific between our two countries. And we are here to see what kind, what kind of a choice the United States will make, how you see the world today, how you see China's development, how you see this relationship between our two countries. I know this year you have important choices to make, but this is also an extremely important choice for you to make. Will you make the right choice? Can we go forward with a win-win partnership? I hope you make the right choice. I hope you do so in a very clear way. So these are my initial comments. Perhaps we could spend the next few minutes uh, having some exchanges. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you so much, Ambassador Tsui, for a very clear and comprehensive statement of uh, Chinese interests and Chinese policy. I, I think I'll just take the prerogative uh, of the chair, if I can, just to ask the first question. You mentioned that this arbitration case uh, might intensify uh, conflict, confrontation, and might even open the door for abusing arbitration procedures. Um, I th certainly hope that that isn't the case. And I know that U.S. officials have described this arbitration, uh, this ruling, as an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to put these territorial disputes on a diplomatic track so that uh, there could be fishing agreements negotiated, maybe joint development schemes, uh, that disputes could really be shelved, as Deng Xiaoping talked about uh, so long ago. So do you think that there could be a pathway forward, whether it's because of this ruling or in spite of this, where there could be bilateral or multilateral negotiations of this kind without preconditions, without other smaller countries conceding sovereignty to China before they uh, agree to engage in, uh, in bilateral or multilateral uh, negotiations? Well, thank you very much for asking the first question. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Mr. Deng Xiaoping. Actually, the idea to shelf the disputes and engage in joint development was a proposal he made during one of his meetings with a delegation from the Philippines in the 1980s. So it has been China's consistent position that we should try to seek settlement of disputes through negotiation, through diplomatic channel. And in the meantime, we should engage in joint development. Unfortunately, they had very few positive responses. And the fact is clear whether this arbitration has reduced or enhanced the possibility of diplomatic solution. 
I think the fact is clear. It certainly undermines the possibility of diplomatic efforts. And some people believe that smaller countries should refuse to negotiate with somehow bigger countries because they are weaker, they are smaller. But if that logic stands, all the countries in the world should refuse to negotiate with the United States because you are the most powerful country in the world. I don't think that this is your intention. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. We're now going to open up the floor uh, for questions. We have approximately 15 minutes, and I'd ask that you raise your hand to ask for uh, uh, the microphone will come to you, and please identify uh, yourself, and please make your question concise. Uh, so, okay, this woman here in the front, please bring the microphone up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Tui. Uh, Jennifer Chen with Shenzhen Media Group, China. I would like to know, uh, aiming to reduce the tensions at the sea, previously Singapore's foreign minister suggested expanding the content of the Q's code for unplanned encounters at sea. What else can you recommend it uh, right now to avoid possible friction at sea? Thank you very much. I'm sorry, could you? Uh... In addition to cues, the code for unplanned encounters at sea, which our militaries have agreed on. I see, I see. Specific ah, militaries, yeah, 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 are there yeah, yeah. other yeah. suggestions? That was the question. Yeah. I think there's ongoing contact between the two militaries for confidence building measures. And right now, Chinese Navy is in Hawaii taking part in the RIMPAC exercise. We should both encourage such exchanges between the two militaries and this kind of uh, joint efforts for confidence building measures. But of course, we have to support this good intention with our actions. So I hope that the US will be very careful about mounting military activities in South China Sea. Such intensity and frequency of the military presence and activities by the US military there, I don't think it will, will help us to enhance mutual confidence. It will really help us to implement the uh, CBM uh, measures. And I don't think uh, under such circumstances, will be able to uh, reduce the possibility of possible conflicts. Questions? Um, okay, this gentleman right over here in the blue jacket, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. The Peng Hui Zhang with People's Daily of China. So a follow-up question on bilateral talks between China and the Philippines. Just now you mentioned that the door is always open for uh, negotiation and consultation. My question is, what is the basis for that kind of a negotiation? Thank you. We have always wanted to have bilateral negotiations with the Philippines. Uh, but of course, it, it takes two to tango. Uh, we'll see what the new government in Manila will, what kind of action it will take. Uh, we will certainly welcome any positive steps. Okay, up front, hopefully a non-reporter. So, <laughs> <laughs> since we've had so many, okay, are you okay. a reporter too? At I, least I, you I really, it's not a Chinese All reporter. the press, but not a Chinese reporter. Please go ahead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You'll be surprised, uh, Rowie from CCTV English. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, but I will, I will ask in English. This looks deliberate, but it isn't. <laughs> People don't believe I'm Chinese, it's okay. Uh, Ambassador Sway, good to see you again. Um, I, I was wondering if following the award in uh, The Hague, uh, A, if you have been in touch with US officials today, if you've received any pressure from them or any um, advice for them or guidance, and also if you predict that there will be any change of policy or action uh, in Beijing as a result of uh, what happened in The Hague. Well, first of all, let me 
express my congratulations on the internationalization of Chinese media. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm in constant communication with the U.S. officials, my counterparts in the White House and the State Department. And we certainly know each other's position clearly. I hope such coordination and communication will continue and intensify to avoid any misunderstanding or miscalculation. Uh, as for Beijing's position, the two statements I referred to at the beginning of my talk uh, outlined China's position so clearly and with such uh, authority. I, I don't have anything to add. You, you don't predict a change in any and policy? Be, be besides, Foreign Minister Wang Yi just gave some interview to, I think, to CCTV uh, to elaborate China's position. Okay, I'm going to ask the next question not be from a reporter, <laughs> if that's okay. All right, uh, the young man in the sort of grayish black shirt right there. Yes, please wait for the microphone. Yes, hi, I'm Hong. I'm, from, I'm a student at the Harvard Kennedy School. I would like to ask, you mentioned that China would do everything possible to safeguard and to stop any attempts to destabilize the region. What actions do you um, interpret to destabilize the region, and what measures is China ready to take? Well, I think uh, all of us have a clear understanding what kind of action would have the risk of destabilizing the region. Uh, let me try to give you a couple of examples. For instance, uh, intensified military activities so close to, to Chinese islands and reefs, or even entering the waters, neighboring, uh, the neighboring waters of these islands and reefs. These activities certainly have the risk of leading to some conflicts. And I don't think they, they I'm quite sure they would have the effect of destabilizing regional stability. And I think that this case of arbitration itself is also something that could have the consequences of destabilizing the region because it undermines the diplomatic efforts. It weakens the motivation of any possible parties to any possible disputes to seek diploma, uh, diplomatic negotiation. So I hope that all parties concerned will refrain from taking such action. Okay, all the way in the back over there. Please wait for the microphone. I think we have all the scholars on this. Hi, Kevin Mayer with NMB Consulting Forum with the State Department. Mr. Ambassador, in your remarks, you said that these tensions arose five years ago with the so-called pivot to Asia. Are you suggesting that U.S. attempts to strengthen its long-standing alliance relationships in Asia is something that China opposes or finds problematic? What I said exactly was that tensions started to rise about the same time that we began to hear about this so-called pivoting to Asia. Uh, whether there's a direct relationship between the two, I think people could have their own views and interpretations. As for the U.S. intention, I think you could ask my friends at the White House or State Department to give you a more direct and a clearer answer. But look at the situation today, one thing is clear. Such an exercise of so-called pivoting have not brought us a more stabilized situa uh, situation in South China Sea or in the region at large. It has not brought us enhanced confidence among the countries in the region. It has made, made conflicts and disputes such a prominent issue on the agenda of a region, regional, uh, on the regional agenda. So I think of the 
the consequences are clear, are there clearly for everybody to see. Okay, we'll take one from the right side of the room, um, over here. I'm Charmaine de Agrasas from East West Center. Um, Mr. Ambassador, if the Philippines proceed to drill now in the Reed Bank, how is that with China? And then what do you propose with the ruling on the Scarborough Shoal, um, recognizing it as a traditional fishing ground for both Chinese and the Filipinos? What do you propose as a win-win solution for the fishermen of both countries? Well, I think uh, we have a long-standing uh, history of the interaction of the fishermen of the countries in South China Sea. And of course, we should attach importance to this issue, try to uh, create some uh, peaceful and uh, condition for them and to restore tranquility in the region. But I think this is a more technical issue. It happens between many countries uh, and it should be dealt with as such. There have been ongoing contacts, I think, between not only between China and the Philippines or others, but also among the regional countries on how to deal with these issues. Uh, Drilling on Reed Bank. I'm not aware of the... This is the area where the uh, gas has been uh, found, where uh, some Chinese companies in the past have with uh, the Philippines companies about joint development, but then it stopped. Yeah, right. Uh, okay. I think I, I know something about this particular case. It's almost 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. Yes. Yeah, when I was still Director General for Asian Affairs. Mm -hmm. It was a very encouraging beginning of joint development. I think it started with China and the Philippines, then Vietnam joined us. We made some, as I said earlier, we made some small but significant progress. But unfortunately, I think because of some uh, legal problems maybe, it did not make further progress. We are open to have such joint activities with others, and I hope we could learn the experience from that initial project, and maybe we could do a better job. All right, one last question in the back over here. I'm Mr. Lloyd, and I write for the Philippine Daily Inquirer. I have two simple questions. First is about our new president. How are, as an ambassador, how are you going to deal China as a whole with our new president, President Rodrigo Duterte, now that he has signified his, uh, atten uh, his intention of uh, a welcoming policy towards China? And number two is, why is China not very keen on having a um, discussion as a whole with the entire ASEAN nations? And why are you more interested on unilateral talks with individual countries and not as a whole the ASEAN? Thank you. Well, I think for issues like territorial disputes, it's only natural that the parties concerned should have direct talks with each other. Because negotiation, by definition, is a process of give and take. If you, have, if you are not a claimant, if you have no stakes there, real stakes there, how can you negotiate with other parties? I don't think that there are I don't think we have a successful uh, international experience where a non-claimant is taking a substantive part in negotiations between the claimant and made some positive contribution to that. that that's impossible. It's only natural that if, if two countries or three countries have disputes between them, they should engage in direct negotiations. It has nothing to do with the fact that whether these countries are big or small, strong or weak, rich or poor. 
Well, I want to thank you, Ambassador, um, for coming out today and uh, speaking with us uh, for having CSIS as number one on your list. Uh, we're delighted, and uh, we look forward to having you again in the future. Please join me in thanking Ambassador Tsui Tian Kai. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I have to run. Uh... Yes, I know. <laughs>